Ivory Coast, another part of West Africa with a lovely coastline, a little bit too much garbage. And I dare say, a little bit of climate change impact. Grand Bazaar is a sort of weekend resort for Ivorians to get out of Abidjan and come down the beach. There's all sorts of bars and restaurants and hotels, but a lot of them are doing this, falling into the sea as the ocean is churning away and encroaching more and more on the land. It's a pretty stark example of climate change as many of the hotels along here are like this one, half in. These palm trees don't have long before they join their colleagues in the sand. This is real climate change. Now, how did Ivory Coast get its name? Well, when the European colonizers and explorers first started coming down this part of Africa, they named the coast after the main trading commodity that they could find. Pepper Coast basically lines up with modern day Liberia, Gold Coast with Ghana, and Slave Coast with Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and Ivory Coast with Ivory Coast. And you didn't want to be Slave Coast, I'll give you the drum on that one. So do you call it Ivory Coast or do you call it Cote d'Ivoire in English? Now, the government here is quite insistent that the formal name in English is the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. So as strange as it sounds, the English name for Ivory Coast is the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Following the theme of flags that look the same, are we in Ireland or are we in Cote d'Ivoire? That's the flag of Ireland, that's the flag of Cote d'Ivoire. No, 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 Cote d'Ivoire, Ireland. No, 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 no. Whichever one, they're very same. You just flip it the other way and it's the same flag. Not quite as confusing as Romania and Chad because you've got to remember to flip it the other way, but it's up there. Then again, Australia and New Zealand can't complain about confusing flags either or for that matter, Luxembourg and Holland. For a good period of time, Grand Bassam, this area, was the capital. And it was the capital until the early 1900s when an outbreak of yellow fever killed three quarters of the population. So they buggered off and they set up a new capital up in Abidjan around about 1930. But as you wander the streets of Grand Bassam, you can still see some of the dilapidated buildings that formed the former colonial powers center of well, influence. UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site because of its role of the colonization of Africa. And since then, people have started to come back and you're starting to see some improvements and rebuilding. This is the former French governor's house in Grand Bassam and now hosts the Museum for National Costumes. But there's one photo hanging on the wall that sums up French colonialism for me. If you look closely at it, let me show you. That's the French here. So France originally bought Cote d'Ivoire under its wing as an overseas protectorate in the early 1800s. But as part of the scramble for Africa, formally colonized it in the late 1800s. Going back into the pre-colonial days, Cote d'Ivoire was the heart of various African royal kingdoms and empires. And he wasn't one of them. But this, it's the Grand Palace of Nzima. Europeans conveniently forget that many of the African empires were huge and wealthy before the arrival of Europeans. Now, the post-colonial history of Cote d'Ivoire started off pretty good, based on a very strong economy around cocoa and coffee. Cote d'Ivoire made up about 40% of the economic size of the West African region. In the 1980s, there was a drought in 1990s price collapses, which ultimately led to some discontent, triggering, unfortunately, Cote d'Ivoire's first civil war, starting in the year 2000. So who was Cote d'Ivoire's founder? Who was the father of independence? Let me tell you a couple of stories about him. G'day and welcome to the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace in Yamasukro. Yamadaba, where I hear you say? Yamasukro, the capital of Cote d'Ivoire. No, the capital of Cote d'Ivoire is not Abidjan. It's here in Yamasukro. Now Yamasukro is named after Queen Yamasu, who was a queen of the local village and town around here back in the early 1900s. She just happened to be the great aunt of Felix Hefwe Buanyi. He's the foundation president of independent Cote d'Ivoire. But before I tell you about Felix, 
Let me tell you a little bit about this church. While the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace isn't a direct copy of St. Peter's in Rome, it clearly takes its design cue from St. Peter's. Now the Basilica is designed to be shorter than St. Peter's in Rome, but overall it's larger and is recognized by the Guinness Book of Records as the largest church in the world. As well as the main church, there are also two residential complexes behind it. One is built for the religious people who run and maintain the Basilica, and the other is reserved just for a Pope, of which there's been one visit when John Paul came here to consecrate the Basilica in 1993. Now you might think that it's strange that a relatively poor country would spend as much money on building as big a church as this over servicing the local community. Well, if you thought that, you wouldn't be Robinson Crusoe. And there was a lot of criticism of the amount of money spent to build this church, and no one really knows how much it was. Some estimates go up to half a billion dollars. So, why is the largest church in the world built on what is essentially a small village outside of Abidjan in the middle of Cote d'Ivoire? And how is it linked to the founding father, Felix Wifwebwenyi, and I'm certainly not pronouncing that right, was born in the early 1900s. His birth date isn't exactly clear, but because he descended from Queen Yemisu, he became the local tribal chief. And after World War II, France started recognizing the tribal chiefs of its colonies and allowed them to get educated. So Felix was educated and actually became a medical doctor. This is where the Cote d'Ivoire story starts to diverge a little bit from traditional anti or end of colonialism stories. The French decided to give seats in the House of Deputies to colonial representatives and Felix got elected to the French House of Deputies from Cote d'Ivoire. Not only did he get elected to the House of Deputies, he became a minister in the French government, being the first African minister of a French government ever. So you started to see in Cote d'Ivoire a more collaborative approach towards decolonization, so much so that economic growth here came after independence based on a lot of trade with France, particularly in coffee and cocoa. And the ongoing collaborative relationship with France remained. And it's not a coincidence that after Felix died in 1993 that that's only when the turmoil and the civil war began in the year 2000. So when Félix Wafwebwenyi became president, he decided to move the capital to his ancestral home here in Yamasukro. Now, to give you an idea of scale, in 1950, Yamasukro had a population of 500, and it's now the fourth or the fifth largest population center in Côte d'Ivoire, with about 250,000 people, or more or less, most of the administrative functions of Côte d'Ivoire and most of the embassies still are in Abidjan, but technically speaking, Yamasukro and its basilica is the capital of Côte d'Ivoire. You know, there's one thing I find kind of unusual in Abidjan, and that is not so much the street side sellers, but the middle of the road sellers who are selling everything. Yes, there's the bottles of water and the fruit and things like that, but I've seen rugs, cupboards, paintings, all being held up by people in the middle of the street trying to sell them to you. I even bought some new plastic covers for my passports off a middle of the road seller. That's Abidjan for you. It is the financial capital of Cote d'Ivoire. And I suppose it's a good place to say, see you later from Cote d'Ivoire.